When I think back to the glory days of Disney before it ruined both itself and the franchises I love by swiftly throwing them into the toilet, I think of The Sword in the Stone, A Goofy Movie, Anastasia, Lilo and Stitch, and of course, The Lion King, and you know damn well which one I mean. But there's one that shines above all the rest in my eyes. One movie in particular that I can watch endlessly and still have a great time. One with lessons, morals and humour with hard hitting emotion that sticks with me more than all of the other Disney movies. Pixar or otherwise. And that movie is none other than Mulan. Now I have seen a lot of Disney movies. I'm talking dozens here. So this statement is susceptible to change down the line. But as it stands as of March 2020, Mulan is the greatest Disney movie I have ever seen and what I consider to be the greatest Disney movie ever made. And this video is going to go in depth reviewing the movie as well as to why I believe Mulan is the greatest. Quick disclaimer, the traits this movie possesses that I'm going to praise, I'm not saying that the other excellent Disney movies do not possess these qualities. I'm simply outlining why I think Mulan executes them all the most effectively. Now before we begin, we need to set the stage. The origins of Mulan date back over a thousand years as part of Chinese folklore to what is known as the Ballad of Hua Mulan. Now there are several variations and pronunciations of this ancient story, so I won't reiterate it here, but Mulan in the ballad is a little different to how she's portrayed in the Disney adaptation. In the original ballad, Mulan is meant to be adept in martial arts, armed combat, and a natural warrior. So with that source material established, let's move on to the Disney version. This movie takes place during the early days of China, where the gender roles of male and female are clearly defined. The women have a duty of care for their husbands as their loving brides and caretakers, while the men in most instances work various trades and serve as soldiers in the emperor's army. Honor is a big deal for the Chinese families. In actuality, honor is everything. These duties, their customs, during this particular time period, are seen as the best way for an individual to honour their families and themselves. Firstly, let's talk about the characters, and namely, the character of Mulan herself. This character is the poster child I always use to outline an excellent, strong heroine for women of all ages to idolise. We first meet her as she's preparing to meet what's called the matchmaker, who one would assume is meant to match her to a husband suiting her. And in the first five minutes of the movie, we see that she isn't quite like what the original ballad would have you think. She isn't adept in combat or seeking adventure or battle. She is simply a clumsy, high-spirited, awkward, free-thinking girl who clearly doesn't seem to fit in. Where she is similar to the ballad, however, is in two main traits. The first being her devotion to her father, which is made apparent very quickly. Despite being late for what's arguably the most important day of her life, she still makes sure that her old and weary battle veteran father gets his tea that the doctor has prescribed for him. And the second trait that she shares with the original ballad is that Mulan can't help feeling that she does not belong where she is, and what she is meant to be doing is not what she is doing. She has to pretend to be someone else in order to make her family proud. The first musical number demonstrates to the audience what the world expects of Mulan in the film as it shows Mulan being prepped as the ideal bride. And while this is happening, the film stops in various moments to show glimpses of what makes Mulan different, including showing her quick wit and intelligence, and her compassion for a young girl being mistreated by the other boys. Perhaps observing the way she is treated was a memory trigger for her younger self, but that's just speculation. But these demonstrated qualities come full circle by the end of the movie. This is all part of the setup. Now, while in the first musical number it shows what is expected of Mulan, the second illustrates why she is struggling with fitting in. That she's different, but she doesn't know why, and she just wants to find herself and where she fits in in the world. Now, some can see this as being cliche, but what makes it unique is how it is presented, and the extraordinary circumstances Mulan finds herself in during the brutal time period this story takes place. Within the first 10 minutes, the main protagonist and her struggle is clearly established. Now let's move on with the story before proceeding with the other characters. The Huns are invading China and the Emperor is amassing all of China's soldiers in orders for new recruits from the province families to meet the threat. The general and father of our second main protagonist makes it very clear that this seems like an extreme measure, but the emperor insists saying that one man can make all the difference. You'll notice the use of gender terminology in that statement, which is a subtle setup for the payoff at the end of the movie. Forgive me, your majesty, but I believe my troops can stop him. I won't take any chances, general. A single grain of rice can tip the scale. One man may be the difference between victory and defeat. Side note, one thing I adore about Mulan is the intelligent metaphors that are littered throughout. As a kid, I understood this movie just fine, but there's plenty of phrases that went over my head. 
till I was reaching the end of my teen years and obviously as a present day in my adulthood. I'll return to this point a bit later, but like I was saying, the Huns are invading, and we are well aware, based on the Emperor's extreme reaction, that the stakes are high. Within the first three minutes, the film has established a sense of urgency for the viewer, and this dire situation becomes more and more apparent with the film's visual storytelling as the film progresses. Now, the Huns are led by the very intimidating and very frightening man of few words, Sean Yu. I've heard a few complaints about Sean Yu being that he is a one-dimensional villain who is simply evil and nothing else, but there's actually a little bit more to him than that. In actuality, Sean Yu is a very proud warrior who enjoys the challenge of battle and the glory of victory. He's not some generic evil bad guy who wants an object of some kind to rule the world. He's not evil for the sake of being evil. His pride is his drive and is ultimately his downfall. He is a man with something to prove. One thing you'll notice about all four characters is that they all have the need to prove themselves. We will discuss this briefly later on. After Mulan fails with the matchmaker, she's ashamed to face her father, embarrassed that she brought dishonor to him. But her father very clearly treasures her, and can't bear to see her sad. He opts to provide Mulan with some optimism. What beautiful blossoms we have this year. But look, this one's late. And I'll bet that when it blooms, it will be the most beautiful of all. Like I said, this movie is littered with intelligent metaphors, and this is indeed a setup for a very big payoff at the end. I'm sorry, I don't mean to sound like a broken record here, but I really feel the need to outline all of this stuff for you as part of the assessment. Once the Chinese army arrives for Mulan's father, she is the only one who sticks up for him. Though her intentions are genuine, her proud father feels emasculated and dishonored after his daughter was so blatantly disregarding tradition insinuating that he's unable to fulfill his duty, despite the fact that he's clearly old, feeble, and suffering from a heavy limp. Again, Mulan's mother and grandmother, as well as the other women in the crowd, keep their mouths shut, as is custom. It's regrettable, but they understand the way of the world, but Mulan simply refuses to. The grimness of this situation is compounded when we see Mulan's father try and use his sword again, but an old injury causes him to collapse. The film heavily implies that if Ba Zhu goes off to war, he is going to die. Later, at an awkward family dinner, Mulan is beside herself that everyone is remaining calm, knowing this is her father's last night in the house. Mulan feels her rebellious nature clamoring for her to speak her mind. Her frustration boils to the surface, and Milan breaks. You shouldn't have to go. It is an honor to protect my country and my family. You'll die for honor. I will die doing what's right. You... I know my place. It is time you learned yours. So far in this movie, Milan has been shamed by the matchmaker, the Emperor's Council, and those were bad enough. But to hear this come from her own father, the one who supposedly treasures her for who she is more than anyone else, this is devastating for her and she spends that night crying in the rain. Milan watches her mother and father inside the house, her eyes full of sorrow, but once the candles go out, her glare turns to defiance, and Milan makes a shocking decision with potentially life-threatening consequences. She takes her father's recruitment papers, leaving behind her precious hair comb, then cuts her hair, fitting herself with her father's armor and sword, and takes the family horse and rides off to war. This revelation shocks her family. Fazu is heartbroken and dashes after her, only to collapse once more in the mud. His wife insists that he go after her, but Fazu makes it abundantly clear that if he were to reveal her, then Mulan would be dead anyway. You must go after her. She could be killed. If I reveal her, she will be. And this is the part of the film that always sells me. It's one of the reasons I think Mulan excels above all the other Disney movies in terms of the stakes and the emotional resonance of what's happening. We have an established and likable protagonist with clearly defined character traits, and her relationship to other characters has also been clearly defined. The stage has been set. The stakes and the consequences couldn't be more dire. Mulan's choice is the turning point for the movie because from here on out, there's always a degree of tension. If Mulan goes off to battle, she is likely going to die. However, if she is discovered or reveals herself to her own comrades in accordance with Chinese law, they will kill her anyway. Mulan is very likely going to die from this choice, and the film does a better job than most in making you think that's an actual possibility for the main protagonist, and in a Disney movie no less. Good luck finding that nowadays. Anyway, Mulan's parents mourn for her, and her grandmother awakens the family ancestors, including what I'd assume would be the patriarch of the family. And he, in his grand wisdom, sends the most powerful and mystical family guardian to rescue her and bring her back alive. But instead of that, Mulan is stuck with Mushu. And lucky for us, 
because Mushu is undoubtedly the best damn character in this entire movie. His conniving, scheming, selfish, ambitious, deceitful, charismatic, and above all else, he is hilarious. Mushu is in fact a disgraced guardian who is as much of a clumsy outcast as Mulan is. Essentially, these characters were made for each other, which is why they make such an excellent dynamic duo. And like her, he himself has something to prove. And that brings us to Captain Li Shang, a young up-and-coming captain with... An impressive military lineage. Shang lives by a code, upholding honor, but also he possesses a degree of compassion for those who earn his respect. And like Mulan and Mushu, he has a lot to live up to, and is anxious to prove himself. So now we have the four main characters, each with something to prove. Mulan has been looked down upon her whole life as a screw-up, but is anxious to prove she can excel if she is allowed to be herself. Mushu, a disgraced guardian who's anxious to redeem himself by proving to the ancestors that he can truly help Mulan on her journey. Captain Li Sheng comes from a military family and obtains a high-ranking position through nepotism, and is afraid of being judged on that account. He wants to prove his worth to China and live up to his father's expectations, so that others don't look down upon him, and to make his father proud. Finally, Shan Yu is a barbaric warlord driven by his pride. Defeat is unacceptable. All that matters to him is the next battle, which he gladly welcomes. The whole reason for his pursuit of the Emperor is to demonstrate he is simply the mightiest power in the world. Hell, the Emperor's Great War was also his greatest insult to Shan Yu, that acts as the spark for his conquest. The Emperor will stop you. He invited me. By building his wall, he challenged my strength. Well, I'm here to play his game. Matter of fact, rather than take the stealthy approach and lead the Han army through the least contested path to the Emperor, raiding and pillaging along the way, he instead opts to take the fastest and most challenging route, specifically to meet the full force of the Chinese army head on. Where the Imperial army is waiting for us. We can avoid them easily. The quickest way to the Emperor is through that pass. Besides, the little girl will be missing her doll. We should return it to her. Some might say that this makes Shan Yu a dumb character, but I disagree. He is an overconfident and prideful character to be sure, blinded by his ambition, that ultimately leads to his defeat. This doesn't make him stupid. He knows he could have easily gotten to the Emperor if he wanted to. Matter of fact, when he suffers a humiliating defeat in the Tung Shao Pass, he and his handful of warriors left managed to sneak into the Emperor's city and kidnap the Emperor publicly. And despite this, it's Shan Yu's pride that lets him down once more. But we will touch on that towards the end. Mulan links up with Mushu, who gives her a quick confidence boost before starting on her monumental task. And she has a rough start to her training, to say the least. Mushu misreads every single male stereotype in the book, which gets Mulan into hot water early. And we meet some of the most lovable side characters in fiction history. Yao, Ling, and Chin Po. Yao is the short, stocky alpha male with anger management issues. Ling is the lanky, comedic, well-mannered charmer of the group. And Chin Po is the gentle giant who loves to eat and is exceptionally strong. In addition to that, I gotta say this movie is one of the only handful off the top of my head where every side character is memorable in one way or another. The hilarious grandma. I should have prayed to the ancestors for luck. How lucky can they be? They're dead. This cricket's a lucky one! Milan's stern war veteran father. I'm going to pray some more. The wise benevolent emperor. No matter how the wind howls, the mountain cannot bow to it. The sniveling weasel Chifu. You men owe me a new pair of slippers! Mulan's ancestors. Well, we can all be acupuncturists. No, your great-granddaughter had to be a cross-dresser. And even the lucky cricket. The only side character I can't really say is particularly memorable is Mulan's mother. She's not a bad character. She just isn't really utilized in any memorable way. But then again, she didn't really need to be. This doesn't take anything away from the film. And to sum it up, this movie has an exceptionally well-rounded cast. And that brings us to possibly the greatest musical montage in fiction history with the exception of maybe one. Obviously, I can't play the actual song because of YouTube copyright, regrettably, but I'll Make a Man Out of You is one of the most motivational, uplifting, wholesome, and just flat-out awesome songs in existence. Something I'm sure Disney is most certainly proud of and will treasure for years to come. Now, because of the heat Mulan caused for herself, the guys want nothing to do with her. She's already at an athletical disadvantage. 
being a woman in the army, but now the men are using every possible chance to sabotage her. But unlike, say, Captain Marvel, where there's a heavy political undertone of male oppression of men trying to put women down, this is non-existent in Mulan. Because all of the men in the Chinese army are treating Mulan as if she's their equal, as if she's a male. They are oblivious to the fact that Mulan simply can't do the things they can do to the same extent as they can, because of her biological limitations. It's one of the reasons the reveal later on in the movie is so impactful for them as characters, because they didn't realise they were being such horrible bastards to a woman who was already struggling. However, despite the mountains of dog shit they pile onto Mulan, time after time she perseveres. She is the first to reach the arrow 50 feet in the air, not because of her speed, not because of her strength, not because of her stamina, but because of her determination and her intelligence. And this paves the way for the other recruits to start excelling as well. The latter half of this montage with music in the background is some of the most catharsis I've ever felt during a Disney movie or any movie for that matter. Watching Mulan succeed where she once failed and watching her gain the respect of her once hateful enemies, who instead of opting to make her life difficult, actually opt to help her along. Don't tell me you didn't feel your heart skip a beat when you saw Ling and the rest of the troops cheer Mulan to reach the arrow. Or how Yao shows what an absolute sweetheart he is when he catches Mulan's kendo stick and opts to hand it to her personally. Within the span of about 7 minutes, we've met these new characters, had an escalated conflict, and we've resolved the conflict and established a certain amount of depth to each one of them. Most particularly Mulan and Shang, who was monologuing for most of this montage. Shang is a tough leader, he is hard on his troops, but he's also fair and deep down he just wants the troops to succeed. He also has what I guess you could call an affinity for compassion, or pity depending on how you look at it when he offers Mulan a way out of the army as you can see here, and we will come back to that. In addition to all that, I'd like to talk about some more excellent qualities this movie possesses as a whole. Before I mention the metaphors, but there's also a bunch of clever humour I didn't grasp until I was in my teens either. I am worth my time, chicken boy. Chicken boy? Say that to my face, you limp noodle! <laughs> and I am Yao, king of the rock. And there's nothing you girls can do about it. And my powers are beyond your mortal imagination. For instance, my eyes can see straight through your armor. Ow! Now, as well as the humor, it also has a lot of mature implications for the events of the movie. How many men does it take to deliver a message? One. Besides, the little girl will be missing her doll. We should return it to her. All of the horrific events we don't actually see. They are set up excellently by the movie, and we only see the aftermath of the events that take place. And the rest is left for the imagination. As a child, I didn't really think too much about the events which would have taken place and what warfare was like back then, these moments are far more impactful to me. And that brings me to another thing Mulan does exceptionally well, and that's tone shift. Let's start with the opening. In Mulan's bridal preparation, she's a clumsy mess and it's hysterical. But then that tone changes to sorrowful and depressing, as the next musical number enhances this. But it's left on a more optimistic tone when Mulan's father lifts her spirits, but then it takes a more serious, grim tone when he gets conscripted to the army. After Mulan leaves, there's always a degree of tension throughout the middle bulk of this film, but once Mulan gets to boot camp, this is balanced out well with healthy doses of humour for the audience, so they don't take things too seriously, to the point of having all the fun sucked out of the movie. But when the tone does need to be serious, it does that flawlessly as well. The best example I can give is when the upbeat musical A Girl Worth Fighting For is playing. It's both a comedic and heartwarming piece, where all of the troops are talking about their ideal woman, and Mulan gets shut down when she describes herself. How about a girl who's got a brain? Who always speaks her mind? Nah. And just when you think the song is reaching its climax, silence. Absolute silence. And nothing but desolation. And for the first time in this movie, we see the impact from the true horrors of war and what it leaves behind. Ruin and death. We see Shang struggle with the revelation of losing his father and the sorrow in Mulan's expression as she mourns the little girl who likely left behind that doll. Most of this is done silently, and it's executed in the most superb way. Motivated by his duty and a sense of vengeance, Shang leads the last of China's troops to the Tungxiao Pass for a showdown with the Huns. Shang and the troops get ambushed and barely escape with their lives, making an effective stance with the bulk of their artillery, 
but it isn't until Sean Yu emerges from the smoke that they realize how truly hopeless their situation is. Shang still opts to fight them conventionally, more than willing to die with honor the way his father did. He tells Yao to aim the cannon at Shan Yu, which is a gamble if it misses. If it succeeds, they cut the head off the snake, but they will still likely all die. Mulan recognizes this. She uses her wit to think outside the box and find a better solution. What she has planned is crazy, but effective nonetheless. And so Mulan makes another daring choice. Disobeying her commanding officer, she steals their one and only hope for survival and dashes straight at the enemy. Once she's in range, she fires the cannon at the overhead mountain and causes a colossal avalanche. Much to the frustration of Shan Yu, who wounds her with a cut to the torso. The avalanche nearly kills Mulan and Shang, but through the efforts of the other soldiers, namely Chim Po, the two of them are saved. Shang and the others celebrate Mulan's bravery, championing her as more than just their equal, but as their savior. But so quickly as it came, the moment is snatched away as Mulan collapses from blood loss. And after the doctors tend to her wounds, her cover is blown and her identity is revealed. Shifu, who's been the secondary antagonist for the duration of this movie, always had it in for Mulan. Even when he was oblivious to her gender, he never really liked Shang either, thinking he never deserved his captain's position. He, being the Emperor's counsel, thinks very highly of himself. Too highly, in fact. He's quick to disregard all of Mulan's contributions and achievements solely on the grounds that she's a woman. He beseeches Shang to execute her. Yao, Ling, and Chimpo also try to step in and prevent this, but Shifu reminds them the law is the law, and they look on helpless, filled with regret. Shang prepares to carry out the sentence, but instead throws Milan's sword at her feet, sparing her. A life for a life. My debt is repaid. Shang realizes that he owes Mulan his life. Despite his sense of duty, the law of China itself, and even his father's approval, his honor trumps all of that. Shang tells the troops to start heading to the Imperial City, where the Emperor is hosting a celebratory parade. So Mulan is left there in shame, alone in the snow. Mushu and her sit there sulking over their current predicaments, being abandoned by the army and bringing more dishonor to their family. And then Mulan realizes something. Maybe I didn't go for my father. Maybe what I really wanted was to prove I could do things right. So when I looked in the mirror, I'd see someone worthwhile. It started for her father, but the reason she stayed in the army was to prove something to herself. That she wasn't a screw-up, and that she could succeed if she was given a chance to be herself. Remember Shang offers her a chance to leave? Mulan chose to stay, but unfortunately she's still left in disgrace. Mushu then confesses that he's just as much of a screw-up as she is, and that he's a fraud. He was helping her for his own gains, but she risked her life to help people she loves. For Mushu, this started out as a selfish venture. But over the past several weeks, he's grown to love and care for Mulan, vowing to see this through with her to the end. This is a moment of growth for both characters, cementing their relationship as friends. Mulan has matured as a person, and Mushu has started to act like a real guardian towards her. Then comes the twist. The Huns are alive. Shan Yu lets out a battle cry that rallies the surviving Huns to his side. Mulan and Mushu watch as he enters the Imperial City. Knowing that they are the only ones aware of this, Mulan saddles up with her father's sword and prepares for the final confrontation. They catch up with Shang and Mulan tries to warn him of the coming attack. Shang is now addressing her for the first time as Mulan, and her being a woman, so openly challenging him, not to mention her prior deception, Shang's cultural instincts kick in and he immediately disregards anything she has to say. But Mulan persists, and then comes the boiling point. Why should I? Why else would I come back? You said you'd trust Ping. Why is Mulan any different? Mulan's pleas fall on deaf ears. She enters the Imperial Palace desperate to find help. And now here we need to talk about something I've neglected to talk about up till now. The cinematography and art style for Mulan is superb. I gotta say, as a kid, seeing Mulan run towards the crowd in this shot is the first time I remember being wowed by animation. And I distinctly remember this shot as it was a part of Mulan's marketing prior to when I actually saw the film. I remember glimpsing this and being like, oh, well, this movie looks interesting. There are so many awesome shots in this movie that I'll just show quickly here. But in addition to that, the art style is so unique and gorgeous. The characters, the environments, the architecture, and so on. This film is a feast for the eyes. And the soundtrack, only the divines could do justice with mere words. So finally, we come to the final confrontation. The Huns kidnap the Emperor and Shan Yu wants the highest authority figure in China to bow at his feet acknowledging Shan Yu as his better, and then we can only assume he will execute him afterwards. Shang and the rest of his troops attempt to use means of force to break the door down and rescue the Emperor, and here is when the movie starts to come full circle. Mulan calls out to her former comrades and tells them she knows another way, 
but she doesn't bother to wait for them this time. She rushes off without them, meaning she plans on helping whether they want her to or not. And it's completely up to them if they want to follow her. And then, I just love this part so much, the boys, Yao Ling and Chimpo, drop the statue and squat up. Milan asks them to hand over their weapons and offers them a set of disguises so they could impersonate the Emperor's concubines, which are essentially his wives. And then, I'll make a man out of you plays once again, and Shang happily follows Mulan this time, as they all make their way up the side of the palace the way Mulan retrieved the arrow previously. Milan has taken the reins once again. This time she is leading the charge, but not in disguise, but as herself, as a woman. And again, she's not excelling because of her strength, speed, or stamina, but because of her intelligence. And of course her bravery. Once they get close enough, a battle ensues with the Hun henchmen. The troops use their training to disarm or render the troops unconscious. There's a small callback to Ling breaking solid cement with his chin that I appreciated. And all of this happens while Shang challenges Shan Yu. As he opts to finally execute the Emperor after this small exchange of words. I tire of your arrogance, old man. Bow to me! No matter how the wind howls, the mountain cannot bow to it. Then you will kneel in pieces. Shang fails to stop Shang Yu by himself after putting up an excellent fight. But Shang Yu becomes enraged after Mulan directs her friends to evacuate the Emperor. And then she cuts off his only means to pursue them. Shan Yu opts to take his anger out on Shang, but then Mulan does this. Wait, my victory! No! I did. The soldier from the mountains. It's left with Mulan and Mushu to finish him off, as he pursues her with savage rage, cutting his way through the palace and cornering Mulan on the roof. Mulan instructed Mushu to take possession of the Chinese fireworks, and she's stalling until he returns. Shan Yu, thinking Mulan is helpless, lunges his sword at her. But she uses a clever trick to disarm him. Then Mushu arrives, Mulan's guardian and friend keeping to his word, and he launches the explosive straight for Shan Yu, who is unable to move thanks to Mulan securing him in place. Mulan dashes off the roof in a panic while Shan Yu perishes in a beautiful explosion of Chinese fireworks, and Mushu's reaction mirrors our own. <laughs> Shifu opts for Mulan to be arrested for all of her misdeeds. This time, Shang absolutely will not stand for any disrespect towards her and her friends stand by her side as well. Shang almost comes to blows with Chifu, until the Emperor himself appears and commands for them to step aside from Mulan as he wants a word with her. The Emperor appears to be furious with her, reciting every law she broke, not to mention the destruction she just caused. But despite this, unlike the previous narrow-minded figures in Mulan's life, the Emperor's wisdom recognizes she is responsible for saving his life and the lives of all in China. Then, the Emperor does something completely unexpected and very cathartic for us as an audience. And words don't do this scene justice, so I'm just going to let play what I can. That little baby is all grown up and, and saving China. You have a tissue. Just before, with his life on the line, the Emperor did not bow to force. He didn't bow in an attempt to save his own life and possibly save the lives of his people. He didn't want to give up his honor. He didn't want to give this murderous savage the satisfaction. But in addition to that, he is the emperor. He is a god figure to the Chinese people. He should not have to bow to anyone, ever. But he happily bows to Mulan. Mulan, of all people. He bows to her, and the rest of China follows. The emperor offers Mulan a place on his council. A position suitable for her intelligence. Shifu, in an attempt to make sure Mulan isn't his colleague, tells the Emperor there are no council positions left. So instead, the Emperor does this. There are no council positions open, Your Majesty. Very well. You can have his job. What? M I? Oh. We hate Chifu. And the Emperor is basically giving him a giant middle finger in favor of Mulan, who's had to put up with his shit for the entirety of the movie. Mulan tells him she's flattered, but she simply wants to go home and face the music. She thinks her father is furious with her, and she needs to face him sooner rather than later. The Emperor then bestows upon her two incredible gifts, his very own crest, and the sword of China's greatest enemy. Mulan embraces the Emperor with a grateful hug, which is illegal, but the Emperor happily lets it slide. She embraces her friends as well, and Shang, obviously taken with her, doesn't know how to express himself, especially publicly. He gives Mulan a platonic compliment and gently taps her shoulder, which Mulan receives with mild disappointment. We already know that she likes him back, but they both have issues communicating it. One of them has to be the bold one, and we will come back to this in a moment. Mulan receives a hero send-off from the Chinese citizens and rides off into the night. 
The Emperor then gives Shang some much needed counsel. <clears throat> the flower that blooms in adversity is the most rare and beautiful of all. Which mirrors an earlier setup from Mulan's father. This one's late. I'll bet that when it blooms, it will be the most beautiful of all. When Shang doesn't quite understand, the Emperor opts to put it in layman's terms. Sir, you don't meet a girl like that every dynasty. To make honey, young bee need young flower, not old prune. Shang realizes his mistake and decides to correct it immediately, and so he goes after her. Now we arrive at the final, what's possibly the most beautiful scene in the whole movie. Fa Zhu is sitting by the pond where he spoke to Milan previously in the movie, and where we can assume he has countless memories with her. A blossom falls into his lap, perhaps the same late bloomer he pointed at the last time he spoke to her there. And then Mulan finally returns. A fully bloomed and matured blossom herself. She immediately seeks her father out, who is in awe to see her again. Mulan is completely apologetic, dropping to her knees and offering up the gifts the Emperor gave her to her father, hoping to quell his wrath. And then this happens. Hold on, I'm gonna go grab some tissues. The greatest gift and honor is having you for a daughter. Before her father's top priority was the family honor. It's what he prized most of all. It's only after his daughter puts herself in harm's way to save his life that he realizes his priorities were terribly misplaced. He receives possibly the most prized gifts a Chinese family could receive, but he doesn't care. He actually tosses them aside, disregarding them completely, just so he can embrace his daughter, who he treasures most above all. And you can see how much this means to Milan, shedding a tear, which she didn't do when she received the Emperor's gifts. And shortly after this, Shang arrives. He's anxious and slightly embarrassed showing up to Milan's home unannounced. He wants to express his feelings but doesn't know how, struggling to find the words and offering her the helmet she left behind. And with her father's approval, Milan makes him an offer. Would you like to stay for dinner? Would you like to stay forever? Dinner would be great. Seriously, Milan's grandmother is head and shoulders above 99% of all side characters in fiction history. Then we cut to Mushu and the patriarch of the Far family, finally looking down at the job well done and he begrudgingly gives Mushu his guardian status back. Mushu is ecstatic and wakes the ancestors as they begin to rock out. While the ancestors are partying in the background, Milan approaches him and offers the brave little dragon a tiny kiss of gratitude for helping her find her way back home. The patriarch then calls out to Mushu for making another mess of the shrine, and we cut to credits. There you go, one fully-fledged Disney masterpiece from start to finish. Incredible protagonists, a serviceable and certainly intimidating antagonist, Amazing and lovable side characters, humor for both children and adults, many morals that all walks of life can learn from, a unique, beautiful and memorable art style, what's possibly the greatest soundtrack in movie history, great action, awesome spectacle, moments of tragedy and extremely high tension, setups, payoffs, structurally near bulletproof from a writing standpoint and one of the greatest examples of a strong female character in fiction. Mulan is the poster child for what a strong female character can be without it being the entire selling point of the story and jeopardizing the objective writing quality as a whole. This film is near perfection. There were a very few murky details I glossed over to praise this film. They do exist, but they by no means derail the movie. So feel free to quote me on this. Mulan is near perfection. This movie is a masterpiece. Mulan isn't just an example of how to write an excellent story with great characters surrounding a brave heroine, but Mulan 1998 is also an excellent example of how to write an objectively great fan fiction. Make no mistake, this film is a fan fiction. It's an adaptation by Disney of the original Ballad of Hua Mulan from ancient Chinese folklore. It makes certain changes to the character of Mulan, which I subjectively believe to be even better than the original ballad, making her less of a fighting badass and more of a free-thinking intellectual. There are several side characters that were added which add something of substance to the film instead of taking away from it. I often get asked, can Disney make good fan fictions of Star Wars? Because yes, the Disney trilogy as well as the spin-offs and ongoing series are fan fictions. The original creator has near nothing to do with them. And yes, Disney can absolutely make great, even god-tier adaptations from other people's work. Mulan is living proof of that to some extent. They just have to leave politics and personal agendas out of the storytelling process. And for the love of God, Higher qualified, passionate individuals that have actually read the source material and respect the original creator's work. Disney did that with Mulan. Disney did not do that with Star Wars. And if reports are to be believed from the upcoming live action remake of Mulan and the people behind the production, 
The politics are still needlessly present, and I can only speculate how this is going to turn out, but if history is anything to go by, these are not good signs. But I will reserve judgement for when the time comes. These troubling reports is the main reason that led me to make this review. I have said it many times on this channel, Mulan is my favourite Disney movie. It's one of my favourite movies ever. So I am nervously waiting to see what Disney will do with the live action remake. But to bring this all to a conclusion, is Mulan the best Disney movie of all time? And the best way that I can answer that is, I'd really like to think so. I've seen a lot of Disney movies, classic, Pixar, live action or otherwise. But I have not seen them all and this statement is subject to change. I am not denying with this video that The Lion King is exceptional, that The Incredibles are incredible, that Monsters Inc. is brilliant, that Lilo and Stitch is fantastic, that The Sword and the Stone is a timeless classic, that Pirates of the Caribbean is awesome, that Bridge to Terabithia is both beautiful and heartbreaking. And that's just to name a few off the top of my head. But from what I've seen, Mulan incorporates all of the elements that make these films so great and executes them as a whole better than all the other Disney films I've seen. And so my judgement stands for now. But with time, another film may present itself at the top of the mantle. And that brings this video to a close. Thank you all so much for watching and allowing me to share my passion for this beautiful classic with you. For those of you familiar with my channel, I'm not usually one for praising things. I'm usually busy deconstructing the bad. But because I was writing about something I truly loved and talking about what makes it so good, I found myself really enjoying the writing process and I'd be happy to do it again. And for those of you new to this channel, feel free to check out some of my other work. I've linked some videos for you that you may enjoy at the end of this one. Now with all that said, I'd like to offer a heartfelt thank you to my patrons for all of your continued support. It means the world to me, truly, I really appreciate it. If you'd like to support the channel with a monthly donation, even if it's just a dollar per month, it goes a long way in helping creators like myself. In addition to that, I'd like to thank my YouTube members for all of your support as well. I really appreciate it, thank you. Thank you to the Star Killers, the Captain Prices, and the Master Chiefs, you guys are amazing. The YouTube join button is below if you'd like to become a channel member. Now in addition to that, if you'd like to contact me, I have a Twitter you can reach me on, or preferably you can find me quite active on the channel's Discord server. What Discord basically is is an online community where fans of this channel can congregate to talk about a range of different topics, whether that be Star Wars, Marvel, video games, Lord of the Rings, and I'm happy to announce with the creation of this video that I've opened up a Disney Classics channel where people can discuss their favourite Disney movie and why. So feel free to head straight there if you disagree with me on this video. Lastly, if you would like to support the channel and rock some fine threads in the process, there's the channel merchandise store. I hope you check it out and I hope you enjoy the designs and the memes. Quick disclaimer, all of the prices are in the Australian dollar and shipping is free worldwide. Hopefully that alleviates some concerns. Now with all that said, thank you for staying till the end of the video. You are a legend and I'll see you next time.